Thanks for joining us. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of Africa's largest nation, people are poised for the elections that have been delayed for two years. Today we're looking at women's involvement in these elections as well as regional implication of their results. Welcome to Our Voices. I'm Orian Itangi Shaka. And I am Hadiza Kiari. Hi, I'm Ayan Bior. And I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and joining us from Kinshasa is Anastasi Tudyeshvio, is special correspondent in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're going to go to her now. Anastasi, hello there. Three words for us. How would you describe the atmosphere in Kinshasa right now? Hello, ladies. I would start with disbelief. Um, that would describe the mood of the Congolese people. Even though some of them saw it coming, the majority of the voters didn't want to believe that these elections, their elections, were not going to happen on due date. Second word, volatile, to describe the situation. When the announcement of the report of the election was made, it was around 5 p.m. This is the end of a working day here, and everybody was really busy trying to get back home. We still need to see what the night brings and what tomorrow brings. Third word would be vigilant. I spoke with one of the opposition members. He's very close to Felix Antoine Chisekedik, who is one of the opposition candidates. And he told me that this word is a very important word that he would repeat to the Congolese voter so that they make sure that the elections, the next elections, are going to be transparent, not rigged, and reliable. So the situation here, ladies, is tensed in the DRC after the National Electoral Independent Commission Chairman Corneille Nanga announced a one-week delay moving the poll to December 30, a delay that follows months of tensions and years of delay as the longtime president remained in office two years past his mandate. Anita Powell reported from here in Kinshasa on the increasingly fraught situation. December 23rd was supposed to be a pivotal moment for the Democratic Republic of Congo, the day voters would engineer the first transfer of power in decades with the departure of the longtime president. Instead, things got complicated. A fire destroyed thousands of voting machines at a depot in central Kinshasa just 10 days before the planned election date. Opposition protests turned violent. And now voters will have to wait an extra week before saying goodbye to longtime president Joseph Kabila after the Electoral Commission informed candidates of a one-week delay, just three days ahead of the poll. He informed us that they will postpone the elections for technical reasons. The CENI says they are technically unable to organize the elections on December 23rd. That's what the CENI told us. VOA asked a representative of ruling party candidate Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari for comment on the situation, but the representative declined. Shadari has touted his closeness to Kabila during the campaign. I was chosen as a candidate for the presidential election by President Joseph Kabila at Ketanja. Ketanja has given me everything. Shadari faces competition from a fractured but passionate opposition, including the son of the former longtime opposition leader. In November, the opposition chose businessman Martin Fayulu as their coalition candidate. But that deal soon fell apart and others entered the fray. Fayulu, who spoke to VOA in Kinshasa, accused the ruling party of trying to spoil the election. We don't want chaos. Kabila wants chaos because he knows what he's doing. He knows his mission in Congo. His mission in Congo is to destabilize Congo. It's obvious. Everybody has seen that. He is campaigning on a bluntly anti-Kabila platform, as are other opposition candidates. We want to uh, leave uh, after us, you know, the old... Uh, bad things that uh, Mr. Kabila has done in this country. The bad thing that the 20 years of Kabilism have done in this country. Corruption, you know, insecurity, um, you know, the uh, mass killing. Shidari's camp refutes the allegations and defended Kabila's legacy. If it's Mr. Shadar, he say and continue with the spirits of progress impelled by Mr. Kabila. He's honest. The order will take advantage of what Mr. Kabila have left. Mr. Kabila, it's a question of honesty. I think every next president will continue what Mr. Kabila has 
is an opportunity to achieve. But it's not clear whether ordinary Congolese see Kabila in the same light. After the delay was announced Thursday, students protested in Kinshasa. With the election now one week further away, so too is the prospect of a peaceful transition Congo has waited for for so long. Anita Powell, VOA News, Kinshasa. A look at the DRC's crucial elections there. And everyone might be looking at the Electoral Commission. They may be looking at the voters um, and even some of the candidates. But I am looking at the institutions in the DRC. I think that if the Kenyan presidential election taught us anything, it's that strong, independent institutions can help navigate a country through uncharted waters. And elections by nature are uncertain. Even elections by nature are unpredictable. Um, and the DRC is, um, has very unique challenges. It's, it's, it's a very large country. In fact, it's the only country in Africa that borders nine other countries. Um, and then there's also the question of what if? What if the technology fails? Yeah. Um, what if there is heavy mistrust um, in, in, in the election result? I think that these are questions that only um, the, the courts uh, can answer. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, in, in any country, um, and, and a lot of us, many of us have experienced that to probably at some point in our country's political history, uh, when you cannot trust the institutions, when you cannot for sure trust politicians or your leader's political will to really bring about change, that's paralyzing. It's paralyzing to people. It's really paralyzing to a nation. And I, I really hope that we can start seeing for the DRC this point where we get past this constant um, inability to, to be able to trust your, right. uh, your institutions. I agree, but you know, the reality is right now the DRC's elections have already been compromised on so many levels. But for me, it, if they get contested at the end, it should be done peacefully. You know, no one has to die, as we've seen in the riots in Kinshasa several months back, even last year. And, but frankly speaking, I don't believe the elections will be credible nor fair, you know, simply because of the wealth of the Congo and the many invisible foreign hands that are in there. I mean, take, for example, the fact that Jean-Pierre Bemba, the former vice president, who was also a rebel leader, he's a rival of President Kabila, he was a trial for war crimes that his rebel groups did went through the uh, International Criminal Court, was charged with rape crimes, and all of a sudden, six months before the election, he gets let go before mm -hmm. he finishes his time and shows up and says he's about to run for elections. Think about the women who have been raped by his rebels. What are they thinking about that time frame of his release? Very also, suspicious. Also, Although you he have, was disqualified. He was yes. disqualified, of course. Yes, he's not going to be running. But just the simple fact that that happened puts mm -hmm. people in question. Mm -hmm. Also, it, the it fact comes back that to the trust thing. The right. trust of these elections itself. And you also have the, the opposition members who have been saying they would not trust the, the machines, the voter machines. The cheating machines. The cheating <laughs> machines, they call it. Right. And then you see that one month before the election, 8,000 of the machines are burned down. So, you know, the fact that for me, who's from the region, uh, we see these things happening. We just want a peaceful transition of power so that the women can just go in the market, sell their merchandise, send their children to school and just put the elections behind them. And that's right, Orion. I'm pretty sure a lot of Congolese people are willing to go out to vote. Mm -hmm. However, I do see factors hindering them from doing so. Mm -hmm. So the other day I was watching um, a documentary on the deadliest journey. Mm -hmm. it, this was on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So it is basically a documentary about the bad roads in the DRC. Mm -hmm. So it made me realize, you know, how much transportation is going to play, uh, you know, a role in people coming out to vote. Mm -hmm. And not only that, let's not forget the Ebola outbreak. That's true. I mean, this, I, I can just imagine people, you yeah. know, dreading to go out, you know, for the fear of getting infected. There's definitely fear about that. Yeah. yeah. And let's not uh, forget, uh, this is the first time that they're using electronic voting yeah. machines um, in a country that is notorious for having some of the lowest numbers of electrification worldwide. Yeah, you know, I worry that the reasons for many for staying home might outweigh the reasons for actually going out to vote. Um, you know, for a country that has been struggling since, what, 2016 to actually have this election That's and right. how expensive elections are, uh, you know, I worry that this is the only opportunity many might have to and actually, they take it. right, and especially for women, this might be the only opportunity they might get in a very, very long time to really make their voices heard. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, that's often so disheartening and so worrying, but I do hope whoever can, can go out to vote, 
go and vote. It is an empowering yeah. move. It's an empowering thing if you can do it. But I have a question for you, Orian, being from that region. Mm -hmm. We've seen so much progress, mm -hmm. um, economic progress, and so much uh, political stability That's in true. that region in recent years. What is at stake for those surrounding countries mm -hmm. in the DRC's election? That's a very good question, uh, Haiti. It being a very big country, it being right. border, bordering nine other countries, definitely what happens in the Congo matters for that region, uh, simply because, as you see, in the east uh, of the country, the east of the North Kivu, the South Kivu, it's a breeding ground for rebel movement, rebel groups, Burundian rebels, Rwandan rebels, Ugandan rebels, different rebel groups that are breeding there, that are harboring there because there's instability in the How country. How many of these rebel groups? About are 130 different rebel groups oh, wow. that are in that region because the military is very fragile. They're not securing the borders. So the rebel groups are just training. They're fighting. They're raping right. the women. They're killing women. So that region is very unstable because of the rebel groups that are there and so the instability of Congo definitely impacts the other region, the other countries around it. So and we're, we're hoping right to see peace that, there. Um, you know, Congo has been a breeding ground, like you mentioned. Um, I mean, there have been several attacks by the rebels just recently. As a matter of fact, just a couple of days, uh, some parts of northern um, Kivu was attacked. You know, so this is something that has been ongoing. I mean, it makes you wonder how many displaced people, as well as homeless people, yeah. would be deprived of you know the ability to vote. That's right. But not only that, you know, you spoke about surrounding countries. It is very critical for um, you know countries to have a violent free election mm -hmm. of course we know like Nigeria's election is coming up pretty soon mm -hmm. so it is a country that is seen as a flagship for democracy for its surrounding countries mm -hmm. I mean at this point if the, the election is not violent free you know what that means for other countries That's right. Right. Yeah. well it might be a breeding ground for a lot of rebels but it's also a safe haven for uh, yeah. more than 500,000 uh, refugees uh, there's actually 536,000 refugees in the DRC right now and the DRC is one of the most complex and challenging humanitarian situations in the world. Um, in several parts of the country, um, there's multiple conflicts. And um, so, uh, Haiti, you asked what's at stake. I, I think that what's at stake is um, the, the safety of these refugees uh, who could see conflict come you know, to their homes again. Well, you know, it, it makes me think when you talk about the, the refugees, what you must be fleeing if you are fleeing to the most volatile region of such a volatile yeah, country yeah, and right. what your prospects can be sad. in right. that country. And that, that, that's worrying too. Yeah. Look, we're hoping that all of this go, uh, goes according to plan. And of course, we want to hear what you think about what is going on in the DRC right now. We're always interested in your views. Go to social media. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at VOA Our Voices. That's our handle. We've got videos there for you, updates, all of which, please, you can share with your friends and your followers. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Our Voices. We're also on WhatsApp. Send us your messages and videos. Our number is US country code plus one three zero four five zero six three six three eight. Reach out to us and add your voice to our discussions. When we return, we'll be asking Anastasia Tudiesh for more insight from the DRC. But first, it's time for your voices to be heard. Elections are not what DRC needs right now. What DRC needs now is for all of its daughters and sons to gather once again to have an open and honest conversation to change the system. You can take Kabila out of the system, but if you keep the system, it will only produce another Kabila. I think what we need to change is the Congolese mentality. Women in DRC are really affected by poverty. They barely have access to credit, so women are the first victims when it comes to underdevelopment. If these elections are well organized, transparent, reliable and peaceful, and the results are not contested, they will have great impact on the Congolese people's lives. Because with contestations might come troubles. So let's wish these elections are run the most credible, transparent and peaceful way possible, so that there is no contestation. Congolese people already migrate towards those border countries. So if there is a change here, it will communicate there, not only to those within our frontiers, but also those who live outside of them. So yes, what will happen here will definitely influence the running of elections outside of DRC.
You're with Our Voices. Welcome back. Today, we're talking about women's roles in the upcoming elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In the DRC, women make up 52 percent of the population, but rarely do they express their point of view in public when it comes to politics. On the eve of elections, Anastasi Tudiesh, VOA's correspondent in Kinshasa, has spoken with Congolese women who are getting ready to vote and some who are not. Expressing herself and standing her ground is nothing new to Olga Kabalu. At 38, the candidate for a parliamentary seat has a decade experience as a union leader in Jikamin, DRC's main mining company. So running for a seat came very naturally, she said. What was not, however, were the challenges on the field, gender-related, she adds. Men are like, who does she think she is? What does she think she is going to do? But Olga is not one to be discouraged by the hurdles. She is focused on her program, rather. Free scholarships for children and fighting corruption. I can't bear corruption, especially in my own country. A few streets away from Olga's office, a woman is eager to vote. She has accepted to share with us why on camera. This is exceptional in Kinshasa. Except for female journalists and candidates, women usually shy away from talking politics in the public space, let alone in front of a camera, out of fear, they explained, for repercussions on themselves or their children. Not Mama Emerance. A widow, she's a mother of eight, and she tells it like it is. We need these elections to happen so that change can happen. We have been suffering too much, way too much. You come to work and transportation is so hard. Then come policemen and you have to give them some money. They can pass here 15 times a day. One bill here, one bill there. When asked about the training with the voting machine, Mama Emerance is not worried. I was not trained to use it, but it's okay. They will explain everything the day of the vote. Cléry Makungu could be one of Mama Emerance's daughters, but she doesn't share the vendor's enthusiasm on voting. If I don't vote, it means I don't feel represented by any candidate, so I'd rather not vote, because it will be a waste. Viera is even younger than Cléry, and she has a totally different point of view on the matter. My name is Vera, and I'm 16 years old. Vera is the proud owner of an electoral card, which is legally possible at 18 in the DRC. Because we don't really have ID cards here, electoral cards replace ID cards. So I did that to have an ID card. Viera explained to us that she changed her birth date and obtained an electoral card without any problem. And when asked if she intended to use her card for voting purpose? Yes, I intend to vote with it. On the card, I am of age, so I can and I will. Four Congolese women, four experiences and points of view on voting, four expectations, all relying on hope. Our parents are not well paid. I want social change first. Let's fix this first. I will continue to campaign, and the last week we will organize a bigger scale campaign. May our children get good jobs, and we, their mothers, good places to sell our supplies. May there be jobs and lots of companies. This year, I'm interested because the mother of a close friend ran for a seat at the parliament. So I'm wondering how things are going to work out for her. In Kinshasa, for VOA Afrique, Anastasie Tudiesh. Yeah, let's, let's ask our colleague Anastasie, who's on the ground, some of the questions that I'm sure some of our viewers are also interested in knowing. I'm interested in knowing about the hint that President Kabila has been throwing out in the media that he might be coming back to power in 2023. Anastasi, what is the sense that you get about how the people, especially the young people, feel about this move that Kabila might make in 2023? Well, depending on what type of young person you talk to, uh, the, the answer will vary. And, and it's not a social question. Um, some taxi driver were adamant they needed to vote. 
And some rich kids were really not interested in voting that, that I spoke to. So really, it depends on your education about politics here and on how you think your voice and your power gathered with others can you know, impact the society. Oh, it's really so interesting to hear that people are sort of getting impatient now. They want that change and they want it now and, and they deserve change. Um, you know, Adastasi, one word that we have been hearing around this election, and you spoke about this earlier too, is fear. There's so much fear around this election. What does that fear tell us about the DRC's ability to hold free, fair and peaceful elections and then see this through to a peaceful transition? Right now, the main focus here among voters is to vote. And they really, I've said that multiple times, um, I think that Congolese voters right now could not care less about 2023. What they want is change and they want it now. I would like to know what are your thoughts on Godfatherism and its implication on the election? I think I know why you mentioned this. Um, the way Congolese people see the majority uh, candidate uh, is that he is being godfathered by the president since the president handpicked him. Um, and uh, what they see and what they say is that it brings lots of advantages. Um, the, the majority candidate never has any issues with lending anywhere, um, not authorities issues. He might have uh, weather issue, issues, but never authority issues. He never has, from people's perspective, he never has any money issue with the campaign, whereas others are still struggling with paying for the transportations and um, the banners and uh, reaching out the farthest uh, places, places in, in DRC. Anastasia, you've had a chance to talk to people and you've had a chance to walk the streets. Tell me, what's the most interesting thing you've seen or heard in the DRC? The most interesting thing I've seen and heard, it's, it's a very difficult one because I've seen a lots of interesting, lots of interesting things and heard lots of interesting things. Uh, but regarding the elections, I was very surprised in a very, very good way uh, by how Congolese people are, you know, devoted and um, engaged and want that change and want that to be heard. Uh, from outside, I could have thought that they would be, um, you know, more fearing. There is fear, but not everybody is. And people who are not, who are not, are really admirable. They express themselves very clearly, freely, respectfully also, but in a firm way, they won't change. And that was, I think, the hugest surprise for me. Very interesting insight, Anastasi. Thank you, ladies, for these questions. After the break, we'll introduce you to some women who are making an impact in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We'll be back in a moment. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. Welcome back to Our Voices. Every day, African women on the continent and the diaspora are doing extraordinary things. And we highlight their contributions in the segment we are calling Women to Watch. Solange Kwale Ngagba, a seasoned journalist turning to politics to advocate for legislation to improve the basic rights and needs of young people in the DRC. After years of covering illnesses plaguing her community, as a member of the press, Solange says her pursuit in politics will make it possible to challenge those in government to better meet the needs of the people. That's a woman to watch. Meet Annie Matundu Mbabi. She oversees the DRC chapter of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, an anti-military feminine organization with a specific focus on issues concerning women, peace, and security. Matundu Mbabi works to eliminate gender discrimination in the DRC, and she engages in the construction and unification of peace. 
Another woman to watch is Imakile Berajeka, who began advocating for women's rights in Congo over two decades ago. In 1992, she founded an organization in Goma, the provincial capital of North Kivu, called PAIF, which stands for Promotion and Support of Women's Initiative. They focused on educating women about the law and enabling them to confront political authorities and to discuss issues. They also began sensitizing the authorities about international law and human rights. It wasn't long before Immaculate started to see positive results from her work in empowering women. Yet, because of her outspokenness, Immaculate received death threats and has been arrested numerous times. She's a recipient of numerous honors, including the Martin Innals Award for Human Rights Defenders and the National Endowment for Democracy Award. Well, now, here's a woman I'm watching, Janine Mabunda. She's the DRC's presidential advisor on sexual violence and child recruitment. Appointed in 2014, she's been working with the military, which is often accused of being the most egregious culprits, to pursue rape cases through the courts. Well, last year, 11 militiamen and a local MP were jailed for life for raping about 40 children. Mabunda says that's a message that the days of impunity for sexual violence are ending. Now, for years, the DRC she has been called the rape capital of the world. Mabunda says she wants to rid her country not just of rape, but also that label. Yeah, imagine having that title for your country. Mm. Use the hashtag VOA Our Voices and tell us who you think is a woman to watch in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It will be great to learn more about them and the work they do in the DRC. And be sure to watch Our Voices on VOA's website, where you can find the world's top news stories. And we'll leave you with a quote from Lynn Nottage, playwright of the Pulitzer Prize winning drama Ruined. She said, I can't quite remember the exact moment when I became obsessed with writing a play about the seemingly endless war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. But I knew that I wanted to somehow tell the stories of the Congolese women caught in the crossfire. And that's our final word for this week. We'd like to give a special thanks to our colleague in Kinshasa, Anastasi Tudiesh. We are a special correspondent in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And on behalf of the Voice of America, and along with all of my colleagues, thanks for tuning into Our Voices. Good day.